John chapter 7 this morning. In our series on Wednesday nights, we've been memorizing different verses, and uh, one of them was found in John chapter 7. And I thought it would be interesting to, to take a look at this portion of Scripture tonight, um, this morning. Caught that, yeah. Caught that. So you're dismissed. We'll be back tonight. No, <laughs> please don't go. <laughs> I hate to preach when there's nobody here. Although some of my best preaching is in my office, I have to say. Uh, John chapter 7, verse 2 gives us the setting. It says, now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. The Jews' feast of tabernacles. Israel had three feasts. Okay, can I get you to turn that off? Um, the, the Jews had three feasts during the year. And that was like a, it was like a national holiday. And, and all the men were required to come. Now, as a result, of course, sometimes their families would come and, and so on. But can you imagine uh, if uh, everywhere from, say, uh, the Sunshine Coast to the Gold Coast and inland, uh, you know, out, say, maybe to Ipswich, all the men gathered for a celebration. Uh, it was an exciting time. They gathered in Jerusalem. And, man, the, the place was humming. And these were things that God had given Israel to remember some of the things that God had done for them. One was the Passover. You remember the Passover when God was getting Israel out of Egypt, and the last one was that they put the blood on the doors, and if they put the blood on the door, the angel, the death angel would pass over. Well, of course, that was a feast that they had. You know, God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Another one was Pentecost. It had to do with harvest. And what a blessing. Uh, in agricultural society, they were very dependent on the harvest coming in, and it was their remembrance. You know, God has blessed us. Well, this one is called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. It's quite a funny one, it, I think. It's, it's kind of strange. Uh, because what they would do is they would make little huts and live in them for a week. Uh, it had to do with Israel's wanderings and their entrance into the land. When they were going from Egypt to Israel, they just lived in tents. They lived in uh, temporary uh, housing. Well, in John chapter 7, uh, there in, in verse 2, he says it was the Feast of the Tabernacles. Verse 3, his brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence, and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. Now this is talking about his real brothers. Uh, Jesus had brothers and sisters. And they're saying, you need to be there in Jerusalem. People are wanting to see you. And it was true. <clears throat> Verse 10, when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? He was the talk of the town. Verse 12, and there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, he's a good man. Others said, nay, he deceiveth the people. Howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. So they're all talking about him, but not openly somehow. Oh, have you seen Jesus? Oh, he's a good man. Oh, I don't like him. <laughs> he was, he was the, the, one of the main topics of conversation. In verse 14, now about the midst of the feast. So it's seven days, so somewhere in the middle there. Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? <laughs> uh, earlier, John 5, verse 18, there's this quote. It says, therefore the Jews sought the, the more to kill him. Uh, there, the religious leaders, they wanted to kill Jesus. And Jesus said, why, why are you going about to kill me? And look at, at their, their response in verse 20. The people answered and said, Thou hast the devil, who goeth about to kill thee? But then look at verse 25. This is the, uh, it makes me laugh when I read this. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? <laughs> so they're saying, Who's going about to kill you? Others are saying, Isn't that the guy they're trying to kill? <laughs> Typical of the confusion in society, isn't it? You know, people are saying one thing and another and, and very contradictory. Um, verse uh, 25. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. 
Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? So people are saying, man, he's speaking very boldly and they're not, they're not stopping him. Don't they know that this is the Christ? This is the Messiah? Um, so there, there was a lot of things going on. And uh, this is the, this exciting time at the, at the Feast of Tabernacles. And, you know, people are gathered from all over Jerusalem. Tens of thousands of people would have been there. Uh, it lasted seven days. Let me just read you a couple of verses from Leviticus where he, he describes it. Uh, you don't need to turn there, but just a, a couple of verses. Leviticus 23, verse 40. You shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. And you shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are in Jerusalem born shall dwell in booths. So that's, that's the, the, the Feast of Tabernacle, Feast of Booths. Seven days. Uh, it must have been a, a really exciting and, and fun time in, in some ways, as long as it didn't rain. Uh, each day they would, uh, they would also gather at the temple. Uh, sacrifices were offered. Uh, trumpets were blown. They, uh, they said that they, they used to gather around with branches uh, around the altar. And uh, all those branches, it would be like a, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people. It would be like an impromptu tent kind of a thing. Uh, the high priest would take some water from the, the pool of Siloam in a golden picture, pitcher, and he would offer that upon the, the altar. Uh, the people would call out uh, Isaiah 12, 3, Therefore with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. Uh, they would be singing, uh, especially the um, Levitical choirs, I guess you might say. The, the priests would, would be singing some of the psalms, particularly Psalm uh, 113 to 118. Uh, some of the things they would be singing, well, we sing one of them, this is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That's about Jesus. And those would be the things that, that they would be, be singing. Uh, this had to do with history. You know, this is what they'd done. They traveled and you know, the water and, and so on. But it also had a symbolism. And it was a picture, it was many pictures of Jesus. The sacrifices, the water, the, the covering, and so on. Uh, it was prophetic of the coming Messiah. It was an exciting time. Uh, it, it was in tune with their history and with their future. So, I'm trying to set a, a, a picture here. I'm trying to set a, a, a situation. I want you to picture on the last day, all these rituals have been going on. Thousands of people have gathered. People are humming. You know, they're talking about this and, and that. The trumpets have blasted. Uh, the songs have been sung. People are saying, save now. I beseech thee, O Lord. <clears throat> the festival reaches <clears throat> its highest point when on the last day, the, the priest gets the water in the golden pitcher from the pool of Siloam, and he's, he's about to put that on the altar. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm imagining this. I, I, I think at that point, the crowd would have come to a kind of a holy hush as he's, he's about to pour that water on the altar. And, and from nowhere, the, a voice cries out, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Can you imagine? That's as loud as I can yell. I think Jesus could yell louder than that. The Bible says he cried. It means he, he shouted at the top of his voice. And here's this holy hush, and all of a sudden this voice comes out with a message for the people. And what he's saying is, I am the fulfillment of all that's gone before and all that will follow after. Amen. What an amazing thing. Now, if you or I did that, they'd wrap us up and take us off to Bedlam, you know. But Jesus could do that because it was the truth. All that had come before was pointing to the coming of Jesus. And all that would follow points back to the coming of Jesus. I've got to say, I'm glad I'm on this side of history and not on the other side. I find it much easier to go to my Bible and, and see what God has done than to go to my Bible and see what God is going to do. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's all by faith, but I'm just glad I am where I am. And as Jesus called out at this place, it's hard to, to 
have anything that would be the equivalent here in Australia, in a Western world. But you can imagine it, some holy uh, situation when it's quiet and somebody just shouts out something. Well, that was Jesus. And Jesus had something to say. And I want to point out two things to you here, particularly. In, in verse 37 is Jesus' invitation. And in verse 38 is Jesus' promise. Three words in, in verse 37 I want you to notice. The first one is the word thirst. If any man thirst. See, all it requires to come to God is a thirsty soul. God says, if any man thirst. Uh, we sang the song, and, and, and in John chapter 4, uh, it talks about the woman at the well. And she had come to gather water, and uh, Jesus uh, said to her, Whosoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. But the water I give you, it's eternal. Uh, we sing a song, Jesus gave her the water that was not from the well. That's exactly right. Uh, thirst. And I think everyone is thirsty. Everybody. Everyone who's alive is thirsty for something, and for most of them, they don't know what it is. You know, people can spend a whole lifetime trying to satisfy their thirst with things that don't satisfy. And they keep thinking, oh, the next thing. Oh, that didn't do it. Oh, the next thing. And they can go right to their deathbed, never having their thirst quenched. Because only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Only Jesus can, can meet that need. What you need is found in him. So the first word is, is thirst. Then the second word is come. If you thirst, come. And the only requirement for coming is thirst. <laughs> he doesn't say clean up your life. He doesn't say be a good person. Get baptized and do this or that. He says just if you're thirsty, come. In Matthew, he said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus' invitation was, was come. In order to come, you need to see your need. That woman was at the well because she needed water. And spiritually, for you to come to Jesus, you need to see that you have a need that you can't meet and no other human being can meet. I had an uncle who was in several major religions <laughs> in his lifetime. Uh, he kept looking at you know, different ones. Oh, maybe this one will do it. Uh, there's a man who Jick, Jack, Jack Chick writes about. Uh, he'd been a Catholic priest, and then he became this, and then he became that. Finally, he came to Christ. Uh, you know, people look in all kinds of places. There's no religion. There's no person that can satisfy the thirst that you have except Jesus Christ. Thirst, if you're thirsty, come. You come to him, you come to him alone. But then the third word is drink. There's people who know about Jesus who, are, who have not had their thirst quenched because they have not drunk of the water of life. Jesus says in, in the book of Romans, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, a person can come right up to Jesus and never receive him, never be born again. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I meet people who know all about Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. They, they've not drunk. There was an old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. It's true. Yeah, we, can, we can lead you to Christ, but we can't make you drink. I, I wish I could get saved for you. You know? But wouldn't that be great? You know, there's religions that teach that. and Ridiculous, but anyway. Uh, you have to trust Christ yourself. He says, thirst, come, drink. Uh, we touched on it in Sunday school when Jesus in John chapter 6 uh, said, except ye eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you, you have no life in you. Now he wasn't talking about physically eating him. Later on he says, the words that I give unto you are spirit and their life. He's saying, this is the spiritual truth. You have to take me in. You have to believe on Jesus. You have to make appropriate him is a, a fancy word for it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his invitation. Come. Come. And then his promise is in verse 38 and 39. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And he explains. Uh, John explains. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. 
God's promise here is that if you'll come and drink, if you'll receive Jesus, he'll not only change your life, he'll change other people's lives through you. If you come to Jesus, he'll change your life. He says, I'll be in you. Uh, in uh, John 4, 14, where we read about the woman at the well, he said to her, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Jesus said, I'll, I'll be with you. I'll be in you. I'll be a part of you. In John 14, uh, verse 16, he, he puts it very clearly. Um, He'll give you another comforter that he may be, be, be with you forever. That's the Holy Spirit. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Later on, uh, Paul writes, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? See, when you receive Christ, we only believe in one God. We don't believe in three gods. When you receive the Lord, God takes up dwelling in you. God's Holy Spirit. He enters your, your heart and your soul, your body. In uh, Romans chapter 8 and, and verse 9, he puts it this way. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, it's because you're not a Christian. You're not saved. When you get saved, God says he'll come in into your heart and life, into you, and he'll flow out of you. You see, Christians are not just receptacles. We're not just a cup that, that the Lord fills. We're, we're, you might say, we're a channel. There's a song, Channels Only. We don't sing it much anymore because TV has confused that, that issue. <laughs> but a channel is like a, like a river. And we're, we're like a river. We're not just like a pot. We're like a river. Uh, God is in us and flowing through us uh, to, into the lives of, of others. We're saved to serve. Uh, that woman at the well, the Bible says she went and told others. Here's a man who told me everything I've, I've ever done. In uh, John 4 and, and verse uh, 29, it's, it says, Then they went out, uh, verse 30, they went out of the city and came unto him. People responded to her testimony of Jesus. And later it says, Many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all that ever I did. See, when Christ enters your life, He not only changes you, it changes your relationship to others. Now, I know some people are afraid to trust Christ because they know it will change their relationship to others. I had a lady tell me one time, she said, now, if I become a Christian, I'm going to have to like all those people down at your church. <laughs> you know, I didn't say it, but I, thought, oh, I never thought of it that way. Uh, you know, there's, there's a change in our life. We can't just pick and choose who we're going to love anymore. We have to be like Jesus. And uh, man, it changes you, no doubt about it. We're saved. We're, we sing the song, we're saved, saved to tell others. It's true. We're saved to serve. And what an invitation comes from Jesus. He basically says, are you thirsty? Come on, I'll, I'll quench your thirst. And then you can share it with others. You know, Jesus was constantly in, inviting people. In John 6, 30, 35, he says he's the bread of life. He's saying, you hungry? Come on, I'll satisfy you. In John 8, he, he says, I'm the light of the world. You in the dark? Well, a lot of people feel like that. He says, come on, I'll turn the light on for you. Uh, Jesus in John 10, he says, I'm the door. This one really touched me because, you know, a lot of people feel like they're shut out. Jesus says, I'm the door. You come to me, come on in. Come on in. You're welcome. The Bible says, if you'll come to Jesus in faith, he'll not turn you away. Listen, there's... There's parents that'll turn you away. There's children that'll turn you away. Uh, there's uh, governments. There's you know, all kinds of situations where people say, no, I don't want to know you. Not the Lord. God says, you come in faith. Uh, he'll, he's the door. And his invitation is, come and follow me. And what a blessing to have the Lord show us the way. He not only shows us the way, he is the way. In Luke 9, he said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Jesus' invitation is to come. 
And as Jesus gave this invitation, there were various responses. You saw some of that already. Some were convinced in, in verse 40 of John chapter 7. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. The prophet is, is similar or the same as when they said that the Messiah, the promised one, the one that God is going to send. Others said, This is the Christ. Man, this is, this is the one God has, has promised. Some were convinced. But others, the end of verse 41, some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was? You know, a lot of misinformation, wasn't there? Called Jesus of Nazareth. They didn't stop to think that he was born in Bethlehem and of the seed of David. Uh, there, were, there were others who were, who were contrary, misinformed. Some were confused. Uh, verse 43, there was a division among the people because of him. Some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers uh, to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? <laughs> the Pharisees had sent basically some policemen, soldiers, to arrest Jesus. And they came back without him. And they said, where, where is he? Why didn't you arrest him? And their answer was, Never man spake like this man. <laughs> they were confused. Uh, they didn't know what to think. Yeah, they'd gone to arrest this fellow, and, the, and when they heard him, they thought, this can't be the right guy. Uh, th this is amazing stuff. You know, what Jesus said astonished people. It, the start of the message, you can imagine having someone call out like that at, at this ceremony. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount, when, when he finished, the Bible says that they were astonished at, at what he'd said. That was typical. And the Pharisees were attacking what, what Jesus said, confusing the people even more. Um, in verse 47, they said, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Now, had any of the Pharisees believed on him? I think they had. Uh, the next man, Nicodemus, saith unto them. He's always identified in this way. He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? So it was very confusing for people, but some were trying to work it out. They wanted to consider. And that was Nicodemus. I believe Nicodemus trusted Christ. You see him at the crucifixion and the burial of Christ. And he's one who, who takes the body of Jesus and, and makes sure that he's, he's properly buried. You know, Jesus' invitation is to come. Uh, Jesus' promise is, I'll, I'll come into you and, and be with you and uh, I'll change you. And I'll give you opportunity. Out of your belly will flow rivers of, of living water. It'll change your life. And we see these different responses. But the key this morning is, what is your response? We're, we're seeing in our young people, you, know, you, can, you can almost see it in, in their heads and in their hearts. They come to a point in their life where they're thinking, God's way, the world's way. You know, what a sad thing. Many of them are, are taking the world's way. And they'll die and go to hell. And the, the sad thing is, they won't even have a good life. Now, you can have a good life without Christ. Don't, don't misunderstand me. There's rich people who, you know, their life is a life of ease. But what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And how long do you expect to live? I think the other day, if I live to be 99, I've only lived two-thirds of my life. I've got 33 more years to go. Oh, man, that would be tough. But what if you live to 100? Then you die. Well, eternity is a lot more than 100 years. And what you do with eternity is so important. More important than that ceremony that they were having on that day. I'm sure there were people who said, oh, why did he call out and ruin our ceremony? More important than that was that they know that man who called out, Jesus. More important than the physical things that we're doing here today is, do you know Christ as your Savior? Have you trusted Jesus Christ? What's your response? Later on in, in John, when, when Jesus is on trial, Pilate is in charge, and he, he tries, he, he doesn't want to convict Jesus. And he tries to get the people to release him. And they had a, a law that somebody could be released, and so he says, do you want me to release Jesus or Barabbas? And they immediately cry out, Barabbas! And his question to them is, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called the Christ? And I would put it to you today, the same question comes to us. 
What are you going to do with Jesus? And I think in a sense to Christian and non-Christian alike. What are you going to do with, with Jesus? Now, stop and think. Here he is. He's the creator. He's the savior. As we've seen, he's the bread of life. He's the water of life. He's the light. He's the one, if you want to know what's going on, you need to come to him. He's the way, the truth, and the life. What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called the Christ? Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. His invitation is to come. Uh, what a wonderful thing it is. Uh, this morning, I, I would encourage you uh, to consider, what will you do with Christ? Uh, let's bow our heads and, and go to the Lord in, in prayer this morning. I would ask you, as, as we pray, to consider your relationship to Jesus. With heads bowed and uh, no one looking around, if you, if you would, are you saved? If you died, would you go to heaven or hell or, or don't you know? God has written these things so that you can know. You can know Jesus Christ by faith. If you're saved, are, are you walking in the Spirit? What are you doing with Jesus day by day? Father, thank you so much for this passage. Lord, thank you for becoming a man, the Messiah, and living and dying for us, and Lord, rising from the dead, and Lord, offering us a life today. I pray, Father, for those here this morning that are not saved. Help them in their hearts to humble themselves before you, to repent of their sin, and to turn to you by faith trusting in what you've done for their soul's salvation. Lord, help us as Christians to live for you. Lord, help us not to be ashamed. Help us to live by faith. Father, help us to be that light and salt that you want us to be in our community, in our home. Lord, I pray especially if there are those that are not saved, that today they might trust you, that today might be the, the day of their salvation. Thank you, Father, for this passage of Scripture but especially for the, the truth that it, that it represents. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.